the Bible is a love story. 66 books with one message. It is God's love story for you and for me. If you have a Bible, please open to the book of Romans today, Romans chapter 6. You can pull the Bible out in the bench there in front of you if you'd like to follow along. God loved our first parents, book of Genesis. He loved them so much that he gave them a free will so they could choose to love him back. You see, without free will, we would be nothing more than robots. Mankind's love of doing his own thing, mankind's love of going his own way is, is obvious evidence that we all have a free will. But when someone becomes a Christian, they make the decision to stop living their own way and start living God's way. And baptism is a picture of that faith decision, a decision of faith to follow the Lord. My message today is entitled, What is Baptism? Is it for me? Would you please stand with me as they did in the Old Testament times? You stand for the reading of the scriptures, Romans chapter 6. I'd like to read to you verses 3 to 5. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. May we pray. Our Father, we have we've had the music, we've read the scriptures. We're going to be hearing the testimonies. And now I pray that you would settle our hearts and help us to lose the cares of the world from our mind and to focus on the message that we find in the Holy Word of God. Father, I pray that if there be one and they're just not sure of where they'll spend eternity, I pray that today as they seek, as they search, that they would discover that you are the one who is seeking them. And I pray for the Holy Spirit of God to uh, open the eyes of their understanding and to see how much you truly do love each one of us and desire to forgive our sins and to take us to paradise, to your eternal heaven. Bless now our time in your word and testimony and baptisms, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What is baptism? What does it mean? Is it for me? Uh, some of us here today, like myself, were baptized as babies. Uh, some of us were baptized as teenagers, again, like me, and some baptized as adults, and there are others who may have never, ever been baptized. And so today you're going to hear a short testimony from, from those getting baptized, and so that means I need to keep my sermon a little shorter and so this is going to be another part of the historic day. And I saw this to encourage me. We do have the police out front. Uh, you were preaching a 45-minute sermon in a 25-minute zone, Pastor. I'm going to have to see your license and ordination. <laughs> so hopefully that'll, that'll help me to, to keep it shorter, to give time uh, for those sharing their testimonies. When I was 15 years old, my dad, uh, my, my biological dad died when I was young of cancer. My stepdad, uh, he, was, he was saved from a life of alcohol addiction when I was 15, and he began taking us to church uh, where I learned the gospel and became a Christian. On Christmas break, 1975, we were at my grandmother's farm in Pennsylvania, Academia, which is outside Port Royal, which is outside... Uh, Harrisburg, and uh, my brother Steve informed me that that my parents had invited the new pastor of the church there in Virginia to come over when we returned home to talk to us about baptism. Well, being a shy kid, uh, that was a fearful thing to me, and I did not want to do it, nor did I need to, because I was told that I was sprinkled as a baby. And many of you understand what that is. The, uh, the reverend puts his hand in a bowl of water and, and the parents bring the baby down and, 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 and that's what happened to me. And so I thought, I'm good. 
I'm good. And there's no way I'm getting up in front of all those people. Uh Uh-uh, not going to do it. And so while we were uh, here in Pennsylvania visiting uh, the relatives at the family farm, we went every summer, every holiday for five, five, uh, five years, we faithfully went to their Protestant church. Uh, this particular week, the reverend was teaching the teenagers Sunday school in the foyer. There was about a half a dozen, had the chairs in a circle, and he was reading what was called the quarterly lesson. And as he would read the lesson from the book, he would stop and pause and look up and say, any questions? Stop and pause and say, any questions? Well, one of those times that he did that, I I raised my hand and said, yes, I have a question. Uh, This new church my parents are going to, when they baptize people, they dunk them in water. And then I said, we, we don't do that. And then I asked, why? I I wanted to be able to, to defend my baby baptism when I met this new pastor. And now, as I have memory, he put his book down, and he looked at me, and he looked at me for 30 seconds. And do you know what he said? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. And then he took his book and he started reading his book again. It was the most awkward 30 seconds of my long 15 years of life. I just wanted to crawl under a rock. And I, I knew the man. He, he bought my mini bike uh, uh, for his son a, a couple of years later. Well, a week later, we we're back in Virginia at home, and I asked my new pastor the same question. And you know what he did? He did something a little different. He had a Bible with him. And he opened his Bible. And he read to me the Great Commission. And he read to me Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. He read to me Romans chapter 6 that I have read to you this morning. And then on the first Sunday of 1976, my brother and I were both baptized together. If you look with me there in your notes, we find that God commanded in Scripture a method for us to confess to him and everyone else that we believe that he died for our sins and rose again. So baptism is an ordinance given by Jesus Christ. It's a, not a sacrament, an ordinance. And this means he ordered it. It means he ordained it as an ongoing practice in the church. Matthew 28 is the Great Commission. Go, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. Elohim, uh, the Jewish word for God there is God in the plural. And now we understand that from our New Testament. And so what is baptism? I trust my answer today will be a little more helpful than the 30 seconds of silence that I got back in 1975. So here we go. Number one, uh, baptism is our public profession of faith in Christ. It is a dramatization of what we believe about Jesus. It is a presentation of the gospel. Gospel means good news. And the meaning of baptism is tied to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now we're not talking about a church tradition. We're talking about what Jesus Christ did for us. He commanded that his gift of salvation be dramatized. And so what you're going to see in a few moments are some actors and actresses. They're not going to talk, but they're actors and actresses dramatizing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He commanded that his gift of salvation be dramatized. So don't think small thoughts when you think about baptism. I want you to think big thoughts. We are portraying, what what are we portraying when a person is buried in in water? What are we portraying when a person comes up out of the water? What do you see? Resurrection, salvation, new life. Now, Now, most weddings are performed before family and friends publicly. It is a public profession of your undying love for your new mate. And baptism is our public profession of faith in Christ. I've had some people over the years say to me, hey pastor, I'll get baptized. But see that big screen? I just want you to lower it down so no one can see my hair get wet. Well, that's not the point of it. It's a public profession of faith. Number two, baptism demonstrates our union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Look with me in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. 
union. When you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, uh, you are united with Jesus. When you are united with Jesus, his righteousness becomes your righteousness. As a Christian, my faith in him unites me with him. Not the baptism, my faith. Uh, just when a husband slides that wedding ring onto his wife's finger for the first time, about 30 seconds after they have shared their vows, this is a special thing. This is a, an important thing. You are saying, this ring is a symbol that I am yours and you are mine. This is a really big deal. A wedding ring is a great picture of baptism, commitment. When people see my wedding ring, they know that I stood at an altar and I pledged my undying love to my wife, Jody. If you just raise your hand there. Oh, she got a ring on too. And so uh, uh, these rings are, are a, a public witness that we are united together. And so just as marriage unites two people as one, so our baptism is a picture that our faith in Christ united us with him. And baptism lets everybody know what we believe in our heart. We believe that Jesus died for us. We believe that he rose again, that he is alive, and that he is coming again. Number three, baptism reminds us that the power of death is defeated. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We all need to understand that when Jesus arose from the grave, he took the sting out of death. Literally, the stinger of death is gone. Now, we've all been stung by bees before, and some of us have had the stinger stick in our hand or leg or arm, and, and you want to get it out because of the poison and the pain uh, that it brings. And the Bible is giving this, this symbolism that Jesus took the sting. He took the pain out of eternal death. As Christians, we no longer need to fear death. It is nothing more than a doorway into the presence of God that the Bible calls heaven or paradise. At the moment of death, our soul and spirit are ushered into God's presence by his holy angels. We are not simply a, a, a divine spark of divinity that returns to the great big ball of fire and we lose our personality and individuality. That is not the truth. That is not what the Bible teaches. There is no soul sleep. The Bible does not teach that. There is no reincarnation. The Bible does not teach that. There is no nirvana. The Bible does not teach that. There is only heaven or hell upon death. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And so when we, all, when we die, and we're all going to die... We're all going to die. When we die, our soul leaves our body. But the real you is still very much alive, still very much consciously awake in heaven for those who are saved. You will have memory, Luke chapter 16. You will be recognizable, Matthew chapter 17. You may be here today and say, you know, I, I, I just don't know for sure if there is a heaven. Or you might be saying, well, I believe, I believe that when you die, you die. And life is over. We're, we're no different than a, a plant or an animal. Well, how can you know for sure? How can you know? How can you know if you're right or wrong? Here's a suggestion. Let's ask someone who died and came back to life. Now, I mean someone who, who really Died not, not, just, not just, you know, for 30 seconds their heart stopped in the operating table and they paddled them and they, uh, they were revived. I mean, someone who died and was buried and say for three days. And then they came back to life and a whole bunch of people saw him. Like, like dozens and dozens. No, no, no. Like hundreds and hundreds. Like, like 500 people. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. There's only one person that has had that experience to die, to be dead for three days, to come back, and to be alive forevermore. Who would that be? That would be Jesus. 
And when Thomas, doubting Thomas, saw Jesus after his resurrection, he bowed and he gave that great confession of John 20, verse 28. He said, my Lord and what? My God. And doubting Thomas never doubted again. And so in addition to the dozens of miracles, in addition to the healing hundreds of people, Jesus split history in two at his birth. B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. And so today, right now today, today is March the 1st, 2020, marked by the birth of Christ, 2020, the 2020th year of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you can't even write the date without recognizing how important Jesus Christ is. He inspired millions of people to do good in his name, to build hospitals, to feed the poor, to free the slaves, to preach the gospel, to support the weak and the handicapped, to provide safe havens for victims of human trafficking and abused women. He inspired thousands to produce the greatest works of art and music the world has ever known. And after living a sinless, perfect life, uh, fulfilling the, the Bible prophecies of the Old Testament, 300 in fact, uh, he dies upon the cross for the sins of the world. He rises from the dead, and he tells us what's on the other side. And he says, because I live, you can live. Because I live forever, you too can live forever. One of our favorite VFBT choir songs mercy tree and my eyes swell with tears every time the choir sings that chorus death has died love has won hallelujah hallelujah Jesus Christ has overcome he has risen from the dead another powerful song says death is crushed to death what an, an incredible way to describe what Jesus did on our behalf. Death has died. It has no power. Death is crushed to death. And so we as Christians do not have to fear death. We do not have to fear cancer. We do not have to fear heart disease. We do not have to fear the flu. And we do not have to fear the you got it. You got it. You don't have to fear the coronavirus. Christians live with peace. We live with peace, not fear. The Bible says that when we become a Christian, we have, we have peace with God. But the Bible says as, as we grow in our faith, we have the peace of God. We have a peace that passes all understanding. Whether you face trials, whether you face persecution, whether you face the unknown, I mean, they're, they're not even words to describe how wonderful the peace that God gives to those who follow him. Number four, baptism symbolizes our new life in Christ. We see that in verse four and five. We are buried with him by baptism into death, uh, that as like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. Five, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Do you see the imagery? Do you see the symbol? We die with Christ, we're buried with Christ in a tomb of water, and we rise to new life with Christ. Now the key word is likeness. It means a picture. And so water baptism is a picture of the gospel. And that's given to us in 1 Corinthians 15 I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he rose again the third day now the word the word baptize is a Greek word and if I say it in Greek it's the word baptizo baptizo and if you look it up the word literally means to dip or immerse so the word baptize is really a, a transliteration of the word, but the definition of the word is to, it means to dip or immerse. The word does not mean pour. The word does not mean sprinkle. 
And all scholars, I mean all scholars agree that the early church immersed their new Christians. Do you remember Philip leading the Ethiopian leader to, to Christ in Acts chapter 8? Philip said, if you, if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, then you can be baptized. Verse 38, and they went down into the water, both of them into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And then in John chapter 3, it says, he, John was baptizing near Salem because. Well, because why? Because there was much water there. They came and they were baptized. You don't need a lot of water if you're just sprinkling someone. I mean, about a gallon could easily do 500 people. Uh, but, but they were baptizing by immersion and you need a lot of water. Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42, it says, 41 says, 3,000 received Christ on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast. 3,000 from all over the Roman Empire. They got saved, they got baptized. And now, now after 1,900 years, archaeology has a and covered the Jewish mikvahs uh, where they would walk down in for the ceremonial cleansing and walk back up. And so the Christians use those dozens and dozens of Jewish mikvahs there in Jerusalem right outside the uh, uh, Temple Mount to be able to baptize people. Number five, baptism does not wash away sins. And there's, if there's somehow you could put a star, underline, circle it, burn it into your mind, this is the most important point. Baptism does not wash away sins because salvation is a gift of God. Salvation is a free gift of God. Even though God is holy, just, and righteous, he is also loving, merciful, kind, and gracious. And so the only way to satisfy God's justice was to provide a substitute to take the penalty of our sin. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the promised Jewish Messiah of 22, Isaiah chapter 53, fulfills all the requirements of being the perfect sacrifice. The entire Levitical sacrificial system of the Old Testament was a shadow, and Jesus Christ is the fulfillment. So when John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And that's why God allowed the Jewish sacrificial system to cease because the final sacrifice came. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. His death paid our penalty. Our faith in him brings his forgiveness to our soul. And so now I'd like to be able to share with you the testimonies of those who would like to get baptized in, in this service. And they're going to testify to you today that they're not going to get baptized to wash away their sins. They're not going to get baptized so they can go to heaven. No, no, their faith in Christ secures their salvation. And so as I call their name, uh, they can stand up and participate in our service today. Uh, Daniel uh, Cleese, if Daniel would go ahead and stand up. There he is. And so Daniel, I met with him, and he told me about how he got saved, and this is what he wrote. You can be seated. My name is Daniel Cleese, and I'm nine years old. I've been coming to VFBT since I was two. The gospel has been presented to me since I was little, not only at church, but at home. On August the 4th, 2018, I was in my bedroom with my mom, and we were talking about salvation. So that night, I made the decision to receive Jesus Christ into my heart. You would probably wonder, why would such a young kid like me need to be saved? Because I believe that God loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so that I can be forgiven of all of my sins. He was risen and he is alive today. Jesus is my friend and Savior. God bless you, Daniel. Then also, Sophia, Sophia Munib. Sophia, you would just stand up. Good to see you today. Uh, she attends our school here. You can be seated. Uh, Sophia writes, I always knew I would go to heaven and was always happy about it. One day I heard the message of salvation when I was in my kindergarten class. I spoke with my teacher, Mrs. Wendell, who told me about the importance of salvation. She told me to talk about it with my mom. So I did. I spoke with my mom, who talked to me about salvation again, and we prayed, and I accepted Jesus in my heart as my Savior. I was attending a church service with my mom at Christmas, and I heard the message of salvation. I had doubts about my salvation and wanted to be sure I was saved. 
And so I asked Jesus again to come into my heart and be my Savior uh, to know for sure. I know he died to pay for my sins. I love Jesus. I want to follow up with my baptism. I'm so happy Jesus is my Savior. God bless you, Sophia. And then Judy Startzel. Judy, if you just stand up, good to see you. And you can be seated as well. Uh, Judy writes, I started my journey to salvation in 1983. I had a co-worker who read the Bible at lunch. I was very drawn to her peace. She radi radiated when she talked about the Lord. She bought me a Bible one day, and I was uh, saved at lunch that day. I felt that inner peace that she had. I went to, uh, I went to, join, to join other churches, but I never felt fulfilled. Then I met Donna Gottschall. When she had been going to Valley Forge Baptist for a while, she invited me to come. I did not come at first. Uh, then I came one day. I really liked the service. I came here off and on for three plus years. I decided it was time to join the church and be baptized a couple of weeks ago. I felt that I needed to pray uh, and be sure that I was saved and that I am going to heaven. And so we rejoice that God has given you that assurance and that peace. Then Janine Harris uh, Janine, if you not only would stand, but if you would go ahead and come on here to the platform, we have a couple of folks that are going to be uh, sharing uh, uh, testimony uh, themselves. Uh, but we're so glad Janine has uh, family and friends here today. And so she is well loved. And it's been a joy to be able to uh, get to know Janine. Been coming since last December. And so she's going to share uh, her journey of faith and coming to Christ. And we're so glad to hear that. And you can share that with the uh, church family today. God bless you. Good morning. I take this podium not because I like or I'm good at speaking in front of people. Quite the opposite, frankly. It's because Pastor Wendell and Jody asked me, and because one does not say no to people, to two people such as these. Any background noise you might hear would be my two newly replaced knees knocking. <laughs> I discovered my unclaimed gift of salvation on Good Friday of 2017 in the comments section of an internet article. This is the story of the road that took me here. I was born to Catholic parents and baptized into the church in infancy. I took my turn in line to the church confessionals on Saturday afternoon, received communion at Sunday Mass, and got my religious education in CCD classes. The extent of my contact with the Bible was the psalm and gospel readings at Mass. By my late teens, for reasons I need not discuss, the influence of my religion on my life had waned. I would. Its effect would cease altogether one memorable day more than 30 years ago when my husband Jeff asked me, what is the proof that God exists? Proof of God? I had never questioned this. I racked my brain for knowledge of any rational, provable evidence of the sort which I had been educated to seek out and build a case on. I could find none. Mind you, I had not studied, did not even possess a Bible. I had no sense of the transformative power of God's word, no sense of the reality of God, of the assurance of God. I was, in short, very ignorant. And rather than do something about it, I yielded to my doubts of his existence and joined the ranks of doubting agnostics. God tolerated my waywardness for a time. Then he came for my father, and then he came for me. December 2013, my father was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. With life-extending chemotherapy, he had less than a year to live. Mercifully, I had employment circumstances that allowed for me, with Jeff's wholehearted blessing, to help my father with whatever capacity he needed. During one day with my father, a picture materialized clearly in my imagination. He and I were on a mission to God's docking station. My job was to help get my father to this rendezvous capsule and transfer him safely into the arms of God's awaiting angel who would escort him home to God. This picture gave me strength and comfort for the delicate task God had set before me. Just when exactly 
did I start believing in God? Then and there. God had revealed himself to me. I cannot describe it. I can only say that such a thing must be experienced to be understood. I had 10 glorious months of blissful togetherness with my father. I thank God for his mercy and all those who aided him that my father had his strength and vitality and good cheer to the last. Though he suffered a punishing pounding in his final hours, he parted earth with a beautiful, yielding, and peaceful countenance, and I felt instantly that he was with God. In the months that followed, I was filled with glorious memories of my father. I absolutely adored and praised God for blessing my life with him. I wanted to know more about God, about heaven, and my father's situation. I roamed about for answers and understanding, but my fat path was unlit. Then God stopped me abruptly and showed me the darkness and danger of my position. He convicted me during Holy Week 2017. In the wee hours of the nights, he roused my conscience with anxiety-inducing recollections of past sins. I saw how I had disobeyed, doubted, and forsaken God, my Heavenly Father, who had blessed me so ceaselessly. By week's end, I felt deep remorse and sorrow, and that my peace was being justly disturbed and would be to my end. On the morning of Good Friday, I was drawn to a website post titled, It is Finished. It was a reverent, moving description of Jesus Christ's trials, sufferings, and death by crucifixion interwoven with scripture from John 19. The author closed thusly with an invitation to readers to add their comments. Go, go that we may aid each other through our words and prayers. No, so that we may aid each other through our root and prayers to make this Good Friday an opening for the light that is Christ to penetrate our darkness. My senses came to full alert. I scrolled down the comments and was thunderstruck by this testimony from a commenter named Kel. For much of my life, I revered his words and his sacrifice, but somehow found that they did not apply to me. I had a scenario that happened when I was in the military that is played over and over in my mind, leaving me with the con conclusion that, I, that had I acted in a certain way, a lot of people would be alive right now. My inaction caused deaths. And so I have thought all this time that I am the worst kind of monster, one who obeys an order at all costs, like Nazis and communists all of the, and all of those who came before them. My fault has been, and ever will be, thinking that the sacrifice made by Christ on that day was not enough to pardon my own sins. That sacrifice was the ultimate, it is just as much for me as it is for everyone, anyone. It was the nuclear option from heaven. Christ did not visit this earth and take upon himself the trials of living here just to save a few people. He did it to save anyone who would believe in him. And so here I stand, a broken person, guilty of many sins, but totally and completely submitting to Christ's mercy and accepting of his gift of salvation. I never told anyone publicly about any of this, but this Good Friday, it's time conf for confessions, and so I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that Christ is the Lord and that he is risen, and I confess that I need his salvation. I sat there, stunned, astonished. Tears started to just pour down my face. Was this for me? I read on. Amen, Kelm. You are forgiven. I am forgiven. We're all forgiven. And that forgiveness has been purchased at a price. His death on the cross atoned for our sins. And God credits Jesus' perfect record of righteousness to us. It's a wondrous plan of salvation. Let go of the guilt and accept fully the forgiveness. I scrolled 
further and read, if you have stumbled across this thread and don't know the saving grace of Jesus, I pray that you would ask him to forgive your sins and invite him into your heart. It's the most important decision you can make in your life. I prayed right then. Instantly, my soul-crushing sins were gone. And in their wake was overwhelming relief, humility, and unspeakable joy. I was absolutely humbled by this powerful, transformative experience, and the memory of it still chokes me up. If anyone tells you there are no do-overs or second chances in life, they do not know the reality of God and of Jesus. I had known about him only vaguely through my Catholic faith, but the veil separating me from Jesus has at last been torn wide open. Now I know the difference, and it is stunning and personal. I have experienced true life over and feel alive with the fullness and the peace of God. I just want to close with a thank you to all those dear people in my life who wanted to be part of this day with me. My beloved godly friend, Angela Price, has undertaken a solo jaw-dropping 20-hour round trip from Greenville, South Carolina to be here today. She has worked tirelessly in God's name for more excuse me, than 15 years doing her part in getting me here. I also want to thank all of you for so warmly accepting me two weeks ago into this special church that teaches the word of God and nothing but the word of God. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. I'd like to ask Portovani to come this time. Portovani Dominique uh, came to us a number of years ago as a teenager, and he's trusted Christ. So Portovani, you come and share uh, how God has brought you to himself. Good to see you. I just want to thank everybody who are coming to this church. It's such a, a great church. It's a, such a great church. People are love here, and uh, it teaches the word of God. So I grew up in Haiti with my mom. We used to go to church together, but my dad was never saved. But um, living in the U.S. was never taught. But he had to take a, cat, a catastrophic event, which was an earthquake. About 300,000 people died, but God wasn't finished with me. Uh, he had a, a more blessing for me. So he brought me to the U.S. 10 years ago where I survived the earthquake. And I remember I was telling Mr. Sachs, I said, do you know any good Baptist church <laughs> that I could go to? Because he used to be a, my gym teacher. And I asked him if he knows any good Baptist church around. And then he told me, yeah, he knows a good church, which is Valley Forge. And then when I came here, I feel welcome. Uh, to be honest, I have to tell you guys, like, in church, uh, we are family. Like, uh, I have to tell you guys, like, my real family are you guys. Uh, there's uh, people in uh, that hurt me so badly, and I have to tell you guys, like, my real family are you guys. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, I didn't have uh, parents that could guide me into a good. Uh, Christian family, so I went uh, to Kutztown on your university where I got lost into the world. Uh, but to be honest, uh, I was living into a dark place where uh, I felt like I almost lost my soul. Even though the price it took was, even though the price it took was high, but you know what? It was all worth it. Because I know now I'm saved. Uh, I know I have eternal life. I know I, I, God saved me from. I remember last year, uh, God used Dr. Nizir to heal my heart. I was suffering a heart failure. And uh, there was no open heart surgery, but he, he went through ablation. Dr. Nizir told uh, my parents, uh, that like he never sees such miracles like that, that he's gonna write a book about my case. 
uh, I was like, wow. I was shocked because uh, I was like, you know what? Maybe that's the time I need to seek the word because if God uses Dr. Nizio to heal my heart, like, I think God's using me for his purpose. So I'm like, you know what? It's time to seek God. And then, to be honest, I got lost again into the word. And then uh, because I wasn't with Christ and uh, the enemy uh, got into my life and then I destroyed everything and destroyed my marriage. Uh, I messed up with my mind. And, uh, but to be honest, I have to tell you, uh, God loves his children. He will never let us suffer. And, uh, but my story is very complicated, but I've, I'm going to leave it in the scripture. Ephesians 6, verse 12, 13 says, For we were so not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against power, against the ruler of the darkness of this world word against spiritual wickedness in high places. So I was battling with a tough spiritual fight, but now I have the whole armor of God. Now I know I declare no weapon from against me will prosper, and uh, I know now I'm in Christ, so I will not let, again, the enemy will not use any weapon to uh, mess up with my mind, mess up with my Amen. God can use even the great earthquake in another nation to bring people to himself. One last one is Joe and Lucille, and they, uh, they've asked me to be able to share that by way of writing. Thank you for standing up there, and you can be seated as well. Here is Joe. Joe says, I was delivering a John Deere tractor to the church when Jeff Hamm took the time to ask me about my spiritual life and invited me to church. Lucille and I had been disillusioned with our previous church experience and wanted something that was real and genuine. Uh, Lucille writes, I work at Kohl's, and around the, this time, the same time, I kept receiving pamphlets and invitations from ladies to come to Valley Forge Baptist. One day, a lady named Jody Wendell, and you don't have to stand, uh, she uh, <laughs> gave me an invitation to church, but then she came back and gave me a VBS invite for our grandchildren. Uh, Jody now calls it her Kohl's ministry. And so we said, let's go for a visit. Back to Joe. Joe said, we made an appointment with Pastor Joyner after our first visit, and there in his office, he told me very clearly what Jesus did for me on the cross, and I received Christ as my Savior. Lucille then writes, I was hearing all of this for the first time, and I said I just wasn't ready. I told Pastor Joyner I needed to think about it. We continued to come to church. We love the music. We love the sermons. Last summer, Pastor Wendell offered the Discover class, and we started attending. There he explained all about the church and how to go to heaven. Joe and I met with Pastor and Jody in his office, and this is the picture of when this happened. And I asked the Lord to be my Savior. He has filled my heart with joy, and we are both excited to be baptized. See what happens? I'm telling you, <laughs> good things happen when you receive Christ. And then back to that Baptism Sunday slide, and at the bottom of your notes, you, you, the, I, this final statement. If you are not sure that heaven is your home, the good news is for you today, you do not have to get baptized to receive God's forgiveness. Recognize that you need to be forgiven. I call it the ABCs of how to go to heaven. A, admit that you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died for you. Believe that he rose again. C, commit your life to Jesus Christ today. May we pray. As we pray, our folks are preparing for baptism. Father, thank you now for this opportunity to be able to invite you by your Holy Spirit to touch people to come into your family by faith. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, as we show respect uh, to those around us, to our neighbor, I have two questions. The first question is, do you know for certain that heaven is your home? Have you made that decision to receive Jesus Christ? Are you a child of God, born into God's family, and you remember a time, you remember a place where you were when you invited 
the Lord Jesus to become your Savior. If you have that memory, you have that assurance, would you simply raise your hand all over this congregation that you have trusted Christ as your Savior? God bless you. You may put your hands down. You hear today, you say, Pastor, I, I think I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven. But I'm not sure. I have doubts. May I say to you today that God brought you here to hear that wonderful news, that gospel, that good news, that God loves you, Jesus died for you, and you can receive him as your Savior today. You say, how do I do that? The Bible says that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You can do what I did as a 15-year-old, pray right from your seat. Sincerely, you can pray silently. God will hear the prayer of your heart. But if you sense the Spirit of God touching your heart today, pray with me right where you're seated. You say, what do I pray? Well, you are acknowledging that you need forgiveness and that Jesus is the Savior. So would you pray with me now, silently, sincerely, dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. I want to ask you now, if you prayed that prayer, I just want to pray for you. I'll not point you out. I'll not embarrass you in any way. But you say, Pastor, I just prayed with you and I meant it. Would you simply raise up your hand? Just slip your hand up. You say, I just pray with you. God bless you. Anyone else? I just pray with you and I meant it from my heart. Father, thank you for the word of God and the power of forgiveness in our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we stand together, let's sing just one verse of my Jesus, I love thee. As our folks prepare for baptism, may we sing it from our heart because of his great love for us. On the first verse. My Jesus, I love thee. I know. Thank you. You may be seated. Ruth, if you want to come on the platform for just a moment. This is Ruth Faust, and Ruth has trusted the Lord Jesus as her Savior. She wants to become part of our family, and we are so glad that God has brought her our way, and she is going to be baptized at the next Baptism Sunday, the end of May. So, Ruth, so glad that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Her father preached the Word of God as a pastor. All those in favor of receiving Ruth Faust into our church family today, let it be known with a hearty amen. 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 Ruth, God bless you. You can be seated here in the front row, and you come by and welcome Ruth into our church in just a few moments. Ushers are coming at this time with our Easter handout. Seven out of ten people who come to church come because a friend invited them. We'd like to give you this. Uh, you check the bulletin. You'll see our mission of the week is Dan and Louise Freeman. Uh, they're the ones that asked Pastor Rusty to come here uh, for that training. Pastor Anthony Garris will be preaching next Sunday. We leave on Saturday for Guam to see Jeremy Katie and our new grandbaby. Pastor Garris was here for Black History Month Chapel on Friday. You can see that on Facebook if you'd like to follow with that. Now as we prepare for baptism, you're going to hear uh, from my daughter Megan about up next what's coming as we prepare for baptism. Thank you for joining us for our first ever Baptism Sunday. If you have never taken this step of obedience, your next opportunity is coming up on May 31st. Schedule a meeting with one of our pastors if you are interested in being a part of that special service. We are excited to give you the opportunity to come and visit Valley Forge Baptist Academy. Our open house is on Monday, March 2nd, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Or if you'd like to see VFBA in action from 10 a.m. to noon, come meet some of our fantastic students and wonderful staff. We'd love to have you come. 
Wednesday, March 11th, our sixth graders and elementary students will be presenting a play called Judge Julie Truly and the Case of the Holy Roof. They have put a lot of time and effort into preparing, and you will definitely be blessed by their presentation. At Valley Forge, we are always looking for creative ways to share the gospel with our community. One of those opportunities is coming up on Saturday, March 28th. We will be hosting a cornhole tournament in the Family Life Center starting at 9 a.m. So invite a friend to join you for this fun event. And if you are interested in helping at this event, just use your connection card to let us know. Easter is just around the corner, and we want to share with you the exciting events that will be a part of our Easter celebration. This year, we will be hosting not one, but two Easter egg hunts, which take place on Saturday, April 4th and 11th. Kids of all ages will enjoy Grandpa Bubbles with his million bubbles. In the weeks leading up to Easter, Pastor will begin a new sermon series that you don't want to miss called Four Followers of Christ. This series will be a part of our Good Friday service at noon on April 10th. This is always a special day as we set aside time to remember Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross. Then, Sunday, April 12th is Resurrection Sunday. Join us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We will worship together with special Easter music and hear a practical Bible message from Pastor entitled, Jesus Reigns. Remember, for that Sunday only, our services will be at 1030 a.m. Make plans now to invite your unsafe family and friends to join us as we worship our risen Savior together. Thank you for being a part of the service today. To learn more about our church, visit us online at valleyforgebaptist.org or connect with us on social media. We trust the service was a blessing and an encouragement to you, and we look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday. Daniel Cleese is going to come first. Here are the steps. He's going to come on down here. He started coming to church when he was two. Wise decision. I'm glad you decided to do that then. And now here he is, 10. Let me get you up here so you can see everybody. All right, Daniel. Look over this way here. Daniel, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen, Daniel. God bless you. <laughs> And then Sophia, Sophia's been coming since she was a little girl as well, and she has family out today, and her grandpa here from very far away, and other family and friends, and Sophia, turn around. Can you see Sophia here? There she is. All right, Sophia, she's a joy around our church and school. Sophia, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen, Sophia. A lot of hugging and rejoicing up here. And Janine, you heard her testimony. What a blessing to our hearts to hear of your journey of faith to come to the Lord Jesus and be a blessing to family and friends. And so, Janine, we're rejoicing with you today right here. Janine, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. We rejoice with you. And then Judy... Judy Startzel, she had a journey of faith in different churches, came here, came back, and she raised her hand just a few weeks ago and said, I want to know for sure that, that heaven is my home and Jesus is my Savior, no doubts. And Judy, do you have any doubts today? No, I don't. 
No doubts at all. God has worked in her heart. We're so happy for you. Thank you for uh, Donna as well, uh, being such a good friend in the Lord. Judy, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, bared with him in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen, Judy. God bless you. Portovani is going to come at this time. Portovani, thank you for your testimony as well. I've uh, been through a lot, but I want you to know you have a family here. You have a family here in the, in the family of God at Valley Forge Baptist, and we're so glad that God has brought you our way. Portovani, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death, Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. <laughs> Poor Devani is actually going to come back in a minute and help me out here. That's never happened before. But this is Joe. Uh, Joe DePaul. What a tender heart for the things of God. We're so thankful for, uh, for Jeff Ham. Let me, let me show everyone to you. Show everyone to Joe. And uh, so, you know, Jeff... You just, you just start where you are. And so he was just doing his work, and Jeff was doing his work, and, and talking about the Lord, and, and God was working in Lucille's life just at the same time. And they came here, and the Word of God touched his heart. So Joe, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen, Joe. I'm going to ask you to stay here. Amen. Joe's going to stay here. Let's, uh, we're going to have the chair now. If you want to hand me that chair. And then Lucille will come. And then we're going to ask Portovani to, uh, to come back. Okay, because of some medical issues on the neck, we're going we're gonna to take it easy on Lucille here. So Lucille, if you'll come next on this side. The stairs. Yep, there's a step. And she has her toes painted just for the occasion. <laughs> so she is all set. It's true. It yesterday. <laughs> one more step, one more step. Yep, yep, there you go. If you can just duck a little bit so they can they can get the picture here. Yes. You're almost baptized. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> so Lucille, it's a joy, and we got to see the pictures of the, of the night that she got saved in my office. Lucille, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in obedience to the Great Commission, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him the likeness of his death, Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> yep, yep. Very good. Very brilliant. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's all stand together. You were part of a historic day at Valley Forge Baptist. Fifteen people that uh, were baptized today, people joining the church, two people saved, one in the early service. Pastor Elsock is going to come. Tonight, 6 o'clock, you're not going to want to miss the video by Pastor or uh, by Chad Shearer of Shoot Straight, and that will be a video that will really touch your heart tonight. All right, let's everybody bow our heads. We'll have a word of closing prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the blessing of being in your house today to see what you're doing in people's lives. Lord, thank you for touching their lives. Thank you for touching our lives. And we trusted Christ as Savior. And Lord, we also want to say thank you that there were Christians of yesteryear that were faithful to you, that handed the gospel to us. And I pray that we would be faithful to hand the gospel on to others. Thank you for each of the baptisms that we saw today and how you're, you're moving in those people's lives. Thank you for Ruth coming. Lord, thank you that we can be involved in missions around the world. And uh, we thank this morning of Dan and Louise in Asia, in uh, countries that uh, some are hostile 
to uh, biblical truth and God, you have protected them and they love those people and they serve you faithfully. Thank you for uh, providing safety for them for so many years. And I pray that we'd be faithful to you to hold the rope for them so that we can partner together to get the gospel around the world. Lord, we pray that you would bring us back safely tonight to fellowship and to learn from your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.